Well, we're continuing through the Gospel of John. I'm excited to be looking into the words of Christ with you this day. So let me invite you to take out your Bibles and turn with me to John chapter 7. And our focus will be in verses 14 to 19. And that can be found on page 1061 of the Pew Bible in front of you. If you were here last week, you know that I titled this message last week, Godly Leadership Part 1. Let's take a wild guess what this week's sermon title is going to be. You got it right, Part 2. Godly Leadership Part 2. I truly believe that as we read through John chapter 7, Jesus is setting up not only before the people, remember this is the feast of booths. This is pretty much the last feast of the season. It's a glorious feast that reminds people how God has provided for them, how God has tabernacled with them, and this is the feast that Jesus will use in order to push himself out there as a godly leader amongst men. Remember, he's fully God and fully man, and we're going to see his godly leadership in his person. And so if you have that out, let me invite you to rise once again for the reading of the infallible inner word of the living God. The Apostle John chronicles these words for us. About the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and began teaching. The Jews therefore marveled, saying, How is it that this man has learning when he has never studied? So Jesus answered them, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking on my own authority. The one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory. But the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true. And in him there is no falsehood. Has not Moses given you the law? Yet none of you keeps the law. Why do you seek to kill me? Let us pray. Holy Father and glorious God, let us hear the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us hear them clearly. We pray that they would cut to our own hearts and lead us not only into a closer relationship with Him, but to stronger leadership within our own lives. Leadership that seeks Your glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. For we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. One of the things that you will always encounter in leadership is confrontation. Confrontation. Some people like it and others don't. You have people that build their whole industry on confrontation, right? You have the shock jocks, right? That they get on the radio and their mission is to be controversial, to shock people, to excite some and to anger others. If you're a shocking individual that creates controversy, you will get a ton of likes on social media. And you're going to get a ton of hates as well. Because there's going to be a lot of people that love you and say, yeah, man, give it to them. And there's other people that are going to say, no, you're horrible. But let me say this. There is good confrontation and there is bad confrontation. Let's bring it back to the church. Confrontation is one thing the church does not like. Many Christians are very sheepish when it comes to confrontation. We don't like it. We don't, like to, we don't like confrontation with anything, especially with doctrine. In fact, I preached one sermon on doctrine. I said, doctrine is that dirty word that a lot of Christians don't like to talk about. We don't like doctrine. It divides. 
Well, I'm going to tell you this right now. Yes, it does. And it's supposed to do that. Right doctrine is supposed to divide. It's supposed to, it's supposed to shine light on wrong doctrine, on heresy. And if some people are offended by right doctrine, then that's a good thing. Because we are called to have our sensitivities against Scripture confronted. And then we as individuals, as we are confronted, are to deal with it. Not sheepishly, but boldly. As I said, there is good confrontation and there is bad confrontation. Here's an example of some good confrontation. Let's say a person says, you know, Jesus is the only way to heaven. Someone might say, that can't be right. I thought it was about going to church and being a good person. Now the confrontation is going to ensue. Because if you're being faithful to Scripture, you would tell the person maybe something like this. No, there's no one who's good. No, not one. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So you can't be good on your own. And going to church isn't going to save you. We are only saved by faith alone in Christ alone. Why? To the glory of God alone. That's really the, the doctrine behind Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8, 9, and 10. So that's good, godly confrontation. But then, of course, there's ungodly confrontation, right? Well, we get into screaming matches with people over doctrine. We start insulting one another and getting nasty. We start putting each other down, belittling one another. That has no place in the church has no place in the people, in the life of the people of God. But godly confrontation does. And we're going to see that as we go throughout Scripture. We're going to see that godly confrontation is actually a mark of godly leadership. Please note that as you study the person and work of Jesus Christ, you will see that he confronts everyone, but not the same. The people who should know better, the religious leaders, he confronts them one way. And to the people who don't know better, who, who are the sheep, he confronts them another. As I've always said, as I learn, as, as, as I've gone to seminary, one of the things our professors tell us is this. A minister speaks with two voices. Not a split tongue, but with two voices. One to the wolves and one to the sheep. When I'm interacting with other ministers... I'm going to be far more harsh with them than I would with any of the congregants. Why? Because that minister should know better. The same way if I am up here spewing heresy, a good leader within the con congregation would speak to me like a wolf, not like a sheep. And the hopes in dealing with someone who's spewing heresy, who should know better, in hopes of, in, 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 the, the reason why we speak to them as a wolf is our hope is that that person would turn back and be a sheep and not a wolf. And so we know that there's good confrontation and there is bad confrontation. But for the confessing believer, we are to address all confrontation as a godly leader. A godly leader. We're not to run from it. We're going to see in the verse before us, Jesus does not run from confrontation. He's not stirring it up, but in a sense he is. They're coming at him. Why? Because he's teaching sound doctrine. And his doctrine, his teaching, finds no place in their heart. The Word of God is speaking, but they're not listening. Why? Because they're filled with their own bias. They don't like him because he hasn't come up like them. Right? He hasn't, he hasn't been taught by their rabbis. So they don't like him. He's not following the protocol. He's not giving homage to the high priests. He's not bending over backwards to kiss other people's rings. No, he's listening to his father. Remember he said, my will is to do the will of him who sent me. Not your will. I'm not here to make you happy, Mr. Pharisees, Mr. Sadducees, Mr. Scribes. I'm not here to make anyone happy. I am here to save your souls. And that requires me 
being a leader, a godly leader that confronts the situation when it's required. Know this, Jesus confronts direct threats to his ministry. This is what we're going to see. He is going to be directly threatened in his ministry, and not just to himself, but before the sheep. But Jesus knows that even as he looks at the flock, there's always a wolf hiding in the midst. Remember I said earlier when Je- at the end of uh, John chapter 6 where Jesus knew that Judas was there, he says, one of you is a devil, right? There's always a wolf in sheep's clothing, always seeking not only to topple the minister, but to devour the sheep. And Jesus, through his teaching, is going to draw that out in the verses before us. But what is, how does Jesus confront things? Well, he does it through righteous confrontation. He doesn't need insults. He doesn't need to belittle them on how they're living. He just uses the righteous words of God. And this is a lesson for each and every one of us. When we want to stand firm in Scripture and, and confront wrong doctrine that is leading people astray, we must do it with Scripture. But know this as well, righteous confrontation requires godly leadership. In other words, you just can't go out there and bash people and use Scripture as your tool. Well, you know, the Bible says, the Bible says, so I'm taking my big fat Bible and I'm lumping people up with it. No, that's not what we are. We're not not Bible thumpers, we're Bible believers, And the way we righteously confront people is to say, yeah, but the Word of God says. No, but I believe this. Well, show me in Scripture where it says that, and I'll agree with you. But I can show you passage after passage that debunks the idea that all you got to do is be a good person, do more, try harder, go to church. And so we see here that Jesus is giving us an example of what it means to be a courageous, godly leader that is not afraid to confront the situation. But as I said, Jesus will speak one way to the wolves and another way to the sheep. Let me give you an example of that. Matthew chapter 23, verses 13 and 15 say this, and this is Jesus speaking to the, as you'll see here, the scribes and the Pharisees, woe to you. In other words, be careful You are treading on thin ice. You are in deep, eternal peril. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you shut the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, in people's faces. For you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in. In other words, not only are you going to hell because you're believing your own doctrine, you're applying scripture the way you see fit, the way it benefits you, but you're teaching it to other people as well. And he goes on, he says, Woe to you, again, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel across sea and land to make a single proselyte. And when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourself. Why? Because you're teaching that person, and now that person is teaching someone else, and that person is teaching someone else, and so on, and so on, and so on. And you're spreading this ill doctrine, this poison, in the name of God. That's why he calls them hypocrites. Because that's what they are. They're living in hypocrisy. And so we see here, Jesus will not hold back. And he will do his job as a godly leader, leading people to life. But know this. Confronting ungodliness is a hallmark of godly leadership. You've got to be willing to confront it not only in others, but first and foremost within yourself. you got to ask yourself, what do I truly believe? And why do I believe what I believe? Is it because it's convenient for me? Is it because that's the way I grew up? My mom believed that, my dad believed that, so I can't stray away from it. 
I have a family member that is stuck in a cultish mindset when it comes to Christianity. Why? Because his, his father was a leader within that cult. His mother was a believer in that cult. They have both long since passed away, but he can't bring himself to think that maybe my dad was wrong. Maybe the godly man that I thought my dad was, he really wasn't. Maybe my mom was wrong. He couldn't bring himself to believe that, and so he stays in it. And so we've got to first address the confrontation within our own hearts that we have with Scripture before we can confront anyone else. And Jesus is going to show us that today in the verses before us. So here we go, back into the Gospel of John. And one of the things, as I said, that Jesus will be showing us is godly leadership in confrontation. And so looking to verses 14 through 16, we see that godly leadership always acknowledges the highest of authorities, God. This is why whenever I'm evangelizing, I don't say, well, I believe the Bible says. No, it doesn't matter what I believe. What I believe is irrelevant because I could believe something erroneous. What I say is the Word of God says because that's the most important thing. Not what I believe, not what you believe, not what you've been taught, but what God's Word says. And when we acknowledge the highest authority, then God is receiving all the glory. We're acknowledging the Word of God as being the highest authority and the last say in all things. Then the Holy Spirit works within us to bring people to belief. This is why I don't believe that there's any such thing as a seeker-sensitive church, nor should there be. Because the reality is, as Scripture teaches us, no one seeks after God. The Sunday morning worship is not for seekers. Seekers can come in if they want. There's some people who think that they're seeking God, but they're just seeking a better way of life. There's other people that may think that they're seeking, but it's God calling them. And so the worship service is open for that. But this worship service is primarily for those who have trusted in Christ as Savior and Lord. Because they want to come in and ascribe to God the worship do Him week in and week out. I can tell you I've been to many worship services before I was saved. And I wasn't seeking anything. Maybe I was feeling bad in my life. Maybe I'd done a lot of lousy things to, lou to other people. And I just wanted to, you know, God, just forgive me. Let me go to church. You know, God, through your bone, I went into church today. I slipped a 20 in the offering plate. You know, maybe we're cool now. No. The worship service is for the people to come in and to acknowledge God as the highest authority of all things in their life. And this is what we are to take out with us as we go out into the world. And Jesus is going to show us how to do that. But know this as well. Godly leadership will always attract ungodly confrontation. Yeah, I remember many times when I was first saved and I would come out of church and I'd go maybe to see a family member or something like that, right? And they would be living a specific way. I say, nah, I don't think, I'm not going to do that anymore. Oh, you think you're all cool, Mike, now because you're going to church? Big Christian? You think you're better than me? And that's what people are going to say. That's what they're going to do. Your godliness, your seeking to be a godly person is going to attract negativity. It's going to attract confrontation. And how are you going to handle it? You're going to handle it with the Word of God. This is why I tell people, no, I don't think I'm better than you. I'm just saved, man. That's it. I'm still a sinner, always in need of my Savior. I don't think that I'm any better. It's just that Christ has saved me. And now I see things differently. I don't walk the same path anymore. And that took a lot for me to say that because I was filled with a lot of pride of who I'd built myself up to be. The guy who always had a nice dirty joke at a party. The guy you could get drunk with, do shots with. But that wasn't me anymore. And I had to swallow that worldly pride. I had to be confronted with that in order to flesh out who Christ has called me to be. So we see here that when we are confronted, not only by the world, but also by God, it's a good thing because it strengthens us. It gives us steel in our spine in order to stand firm in Christ. It says here in verse 14, about the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and began teaching. Remember his brothers told him, go up last week. He says, no, no. 
I'm not going up when you tell me to go up. I'm going up in my time. My time has not yet fully come. Well, the time has fully come. And as Jesus went up as a, in private, not in public, he takes himself right into the temple. Why? Because that's where he needs to teach. He is going right into the sort of the lion's den where all the people are going to, all the haters are going to be there in order to pounce on him as he teaches. So what's he doing there? He's teaching. He's not preaching. Big difference there. He's teaching. And what could he possibly be teaching? Well, the New Testament wasn't written yet. So he's obviously teaching Old Testament. And more than likely, based on what he preaches later on, at the end of chapter 7 and all the confrontation he deals with in chapter 8, he's teaching about the fact that he is the fulfillment of all the Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah to come. Now, can you imagine being there? Jesus preaching Jesus, yet being rejected by the leaders. Why? Because he is offending their sensitivities. Imagine that, though. Imagine that. Imagine we're in the first century. Imagine we're all in the temple. It's the Feast of Booths. We see all of the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, whoever's there, all of the religious leaders there. And there's this one guy who's saying, hey, see all this? It's all coming to an end because I'm here now. This whole religious order is coming to an end because I am, have come as the scriptures of old have said that I would. Imagine that. We'd all be kind of looking at the Pharisees saying, uh, is this true? Is he a good guy or is he a bad guy? Is he right or is he wrong? But he's confronting them and the people are seeing this and it's important that he does it and it's important that he does it this way in the temple because he's going where people believe they are meeting with God and now they truly are. So it says here, this is how they, people responded to him. The Jews, therefore, marveled, saying, how is it that this man has learning when he has never studied, right? Some people may look at this verse and say, wow, these guys are impressed. They're marveled. They say, wow, this guy's blowing me away. He is awesome. Listen how he's expounding on the verses. And that's how this reads on the surface, but that's not it at all. This statement is actually a statement coming from the wolves. And the wolves will no longer be hidden under the sheep's clothes. No, the wolves are going to make themselves known. And that's what's happening in this verse. They're actually insulting him. Let me go back. Listen to what they say here. The Jews therefore marveled. This marvel, we think like they say, wow, this is marvelous. No, 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 no. They're like blown away. They're, what? They're befuddled. They're who does this guy think he is? How do we know that they're saying this guy? Well, look what they call him, this man. They don't call him the rabbi. They're not calling him Lord like everyone else was calling him. They're not calling him the Christ. They're not saying this is the son of David. How does the son of David have this learning? No, they're saying this man. They're saying he's nobody. How does he have this learning when he has never studied? This is one of those great verses that you got to read in the Greek. And so I'm just going to expound on it a little bit from the Greek, and you really understand what it is that they're saying here. The Jewish leaders were befuddled in denial, saying, how is it that this man, this person, this nobody, understands grammar? And now we would say, you know, what do they think? He was illiterate? No, 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 no. It's actually speaking about something else. When he has never studied. This word grammar is actually in the Greek, this word grammata, which also means grammar, but it actually speaks to scripture. So what they're saying is, how is it this man understands scripture, the writings, that is the prophetic writings, that's what they're talking about, when he has never studied? What do they mean? When he has never studied under us. How is it that this man can be in our temple teaching our people when he has not been trained by us. They are offended. They say none of us would ever say what he said. How is it that you people are even listening to him when he is not even trained? None of us stands and vouches for him. And people get offended by that. 
People get offended by that. They get offended when someone else comes along and is more enlightened than they are. And when I say that, I don't mean it's necessarily in this mystical sense. No, and more enlightened by Scripture than they are. I've had this problem. I'm no genius, believe me. I'm no, far from it. I'm no scholar, far from it. But there are certain insights that I have had, and people have been insulted by that. In fact, one guy told me, you'll understand a little bit more once you finish graduating seminary. I get that quite often, and I don't mind. I say to myself, I can't wait till I finish. You know, I got another year and a half left, and then I'll graduate, and then we'll have this conversation again. All right? It's because, believe me, I'm not lifting myself up on any pedestal. I've got a long way to go in my life. I will study my entire life, and I will still die, you know, needing to learn more. But one thing I do is I do my homework. I want to know what the Word of God says. As many of you know, I was once a Jehovah's Witness, and I hated the fact, I resent the fact that I was lied to for so many years. I resent the fact that I was in this cult believing all that they said, that my eternal life was in their hands, and they couldn't care less to tell me the truth. And I dare not ever deliver that to any of you, to anyone because life is too precious. Christ is too glorious. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, re, they deserve far more glory than we could ever imagine to give them. And the best way that we can glorify God is to understand His Word and to submit ourselves under His Son, under His Word, through His Spirit. That's our call in life, beloved. When we get it, when we truly understand it, that's when we begin to become godly leaders. Then God says, now I can teach you. Why? Because you don't think you know it all. Because what do you teach a know-it-all? Nothing. They know it all. And so these Pharisees, these scribes, they are offended by Jesus because he has not been taught under them. The Jewish leaders, here's another way I interpret it, the Jewish leaders were befuddled in denial, saying, do not listen to this man's doctrine he is not studied under our rabbis. That's what they're saying here. That's what's going on here. So they're not amazed saying, they, they, I believe that somewhere in their hearts they know that he's right, but they are offended because he has not come up as one of them. And that's what happens when you stand firm in the word of God. You are going to offend people. You're going to even offend people who have been long Christians for a very long time. I know, I've been there as well. Where I'm, sharing, where I'm studying something with believers that have been believers for many, many years, and they're offended when you come at them with sound biblical doctrine. It's going to happen. But you've got to be ready to stand firm under the word of God. So how does Jesus answer them? Well, he answers them like a godly leader. Jesus answers them, my teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. So if you've got a problem with what I'm saying, you really have a problem with God. And your problem with God is because you're offended by me. I'm merely expounding his words, and you cannot take it. This is the offense that Jesus is dealing with. This is the confrontation that he's having. Notice, not with the people, but with the leaders. Their sensitivities are offended because he has not come up under them. Which brings us to verse 17. And in verse 17, we see that godly leadership fleshes out ungodly doctrine and its motives in order to strengthen the called. Yes, there's a reason why Jesus is allowing this to happen the way it's happening. Notice, everything is within the control of Jesus. He is not pulling these guys aside and saying, hey, you know what, if you've got an issue with this, Let's step over here. Let's have a conversation away from everyone else. No, Jesus wants the people to see this. Because truth does not get hidden. You can't put a veil over truth. Truth is a light, and it comes out, and it shines in the darkness. And as Jesus is doing this, let me be clear. There are people that are watching that are being motivated. They're being strengthened to follow him. And then he says to them, and this is really not just a call to them, but to everyone else that is around him. Jesus is pretty much saying this, if anyone's will is to do God's will, 
He will know whether my teaching is from God or whether I am speaking on my own authority. Do you get it there? They're saying, no, he's speaking on his own authority. He's not speaking on our authority. He's speaking on his own authority. Therefore, don't listen to him. But Jesus is saying, well, for all of you who God has called, who wants to do the will of God, you will know. I don't care about them. You will know if what I am saying is my teaching or if it comes from God. Notice how he's also giving the glory to God there. He's saying, it's not me. You may marvel at me, but you need to marvel at God because what I am saying is what he has said. Well, who's going to believe what Jesus says? All those that are called by the Father. How do we know that? Let's go back to John 6, verse 44. Jesus says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Well, Jesus is living in the last days, and he's raising people up as he's preaching. God is calling people to believe in the midst, in the sea of unbelief. And we're seeing this happen in perfect timing. Jesus is calling these people to himself. I have here, through godly confrontation, Jesus is gathering and strengthening all who have been called by the Father. A while ago, a couple of years ago, when I preached about the sheep, I said, you know, Jesus, and we're going to see that in John chapter 8, my sheep hear my voice and they come to me, right? When a shepherd takes care of his sheep, his sheep learn his voice. That's why when a shepherd is traveling and he goes into a town that perhaps he's never been before and he's bringing his sheep with him, he puts his sheep in the community sheep pen. Why can he do that? Because his sheep know his voice. And when he calls them or he whistles, whatever he does, right, they could be eating, they could be grazing, but immediately, boop, 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 their heads pop up and they come to him. And this is kind of what's happening right now. It gives me goosebumps when I think about it because as Jesus is expounding the word of God and showing that he is the fulfillment of it in the crowds as he's denouncing the religious, religious, the religious leaders that sheep's heads are popping up. And that's why he says there that if anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether my teaching is from God or whether I am teaching God. My teaching comes from myself. You look at John chapter 18, verse 37. Jesus, said, Jesus says, everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. The people are hearing his voice. I want to ask you this morning, are you hearing his voice? Perhaps you might be hearing his voice for the first time. I don't take it for granted that anyone is saved, right? Perhaps you're hearing his voice for the first time. Perhaps you're, you're, you're hearing his voice anew. You've been a Christian for a while. Perhaps you're hearing his voice anew. Don't close out his voice. Don't shut it down. Don't say, you know what, Jesus? I'll keep following you closer tomorrow, the next day. No, today is the right day. We don't know what tomorrow brings. Today is the appropriate day to say, Jesus, yes, I hear your voice. And my will is to do the will of the one who sent you. Therefore, I want to hear your word. Those who are called to Jesus by God will be able to see through the ungodliness. They'll get it. They'll understand when people are trying to lead them astray. And this is what Jesus is fleshing out as he is speaking, which brings us to verses 18 and 19. In them we see godly leaders always point people toward God that he, God, would receive all the glory. Sometimes we ask ourselves, well, was Christ supposed to be glorified? Yeah. Christ was glorified when he rose from the grave and he ascended on high. And the scriptures will tell us that because as Jesus had not yet been glorified, right? But right now, Jesus is taking on all of the confrontation. Right now, Jesus is, is, is being the whipping boy. Jesus is preparing himself to be the Lamb of God who will take away the sins of the world. All of this is building up to the indictment that they will put against Jesus. But even as he is being insulted, put down in front of all these thousands of people who have gathered for the Feast of Booths, 
he is not allowing any of that to deter him from pointing people to his father. We see here, he says here in verse 18, the one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory. Right? He's speaking about something here, and he's actually, he's actually pointing this towards the Pharisees. So he's saying the one, kind of keeping it generic, but he's looking at them, he's saying, you're the one I'm talking about. And you know you're the one I'm talking about because you're the one that is filled with self-aggrandizement. It's a huge word, right? It's not a theological word, but it's a huge word. But it's a great word for us to understand. These people are filled with self-aggrandizement. What does that mean? I can't read that far away, so I'm going to read it off my screen. It says, self-aggrandizement, an act undertaken to increase your own power and influence or to draw attention to your own importance right? That's what they were doing there. That's why they're insulting him, because they put him down in order to make themselves look good. You ever been around someone like that? I've worked with many people like that. They like to put everyone down, call everyone jerks, treat everyone like garbage, right? Because they think it makes themselves look better. Here's a shorter version of that, right? Seeking their own glory. But that's what self-aggrandizement is. They're seeking their own glory. And Jesus is telling them, that's you. That's you, The one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory. And he hears this with a but. But the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true. He's saying, that's me. I'm not seeking my own glory. I'm not thinking these things off the top of my head. No, my will is to do the will of him who sent me, to speak his will into your lives. He is the one who is true. And in him, there is no falsehood. And this is really a challenge because Jesus is really saying in not so many words, if there's something wrong with what I said, challenge me on it. Challenge me on it. Have you ever done that with someone? I say, if you believe that this is wrong, if you believe the scriptures is wrong, then what's your rebuttal? What do you have to say about it? And the reality is, my friends, that no one will ever be able to refute Scripture. People say all the time, oh, the Bible, I don't read it because it's it's written by men. Okay, but show me how it's wrong. Oh, I don't believe the Bible because there's a lot of contradictions. Really? Show me one. And as I said before, I'll say it again, many people who have a negative view of Scripture more than likely have never read it themselves. They're just going based on hearsay. So what's wrong with the Bible that it's written by men? Okay, so what's wrong with that? The books that you read, textbooks, they're written by men. They're not written by aliens, you know? What's the deal? But the reality is all they want to do is put it down and put you down for believing it. This is what they're doing to Jesus. But Jesus has challenged them, and he's saying, in me there is no falsehood. If there is, tell me. So these verses are showing that Jesus sought to glorify God in all his doctrine, in all his teaching, right? And in doing so, he exposes the self-aggrandizement of the religious leaders. He's exposing them to themselves, and not so much to put them down, but to show the people their time, their end has come. And in doing so, he's also trying to tell them, repent of how you're leading these people. Repent of your ungodliness. And then he goes on in verse 19, and this seems sort of like a shift, right? And it is rather of a, sh- a, a rather shift, but it's an important shift. So he tells him in verse 19, has not Moses given you the law? Yet none of you keeps the law. He's saying, because if you understood what I'm saying, then you would not have a problem with it. First and foremost, because Moses has given you many things. He also gave you a prophecy that says God will raise up from among your brothers one like me, and it is to him that you are to listen. In other words, what Moses is saying there is this. When he comes, when God raises that one up, put everything that I told you on the back burner and give him your allegiance. And then he hits him with that, and he's going to use another example later on, and we'll see that next week. But he finishes with this. Well, I put here he's confronting religious hypocrisy, and he says this, why do you seek to kill me? 
which almost seems kind of startling, right? And actually takes the people back. But he says here, why are you seeking to kill me? And I'm going to tell you why they're seeking to kill him. They're kind of befuddled. They're like, what do you mean? We're just having a confrontation with you. Now you think we want to kill you? And that's how they're going to respond in the next verses. But Jesus is going to address it. He's looking into their hearts. He's looking into their minds and their will. And he's asking them, why do you seek to kill me? But Jesus gives us the answer later on in John 8, verse 37. He says this, you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. He said, it doesn't matter how true to the word of God I speak, you are offended by me, you will confront me, and eventually you will kill me. Why? Because my word, which is God's word, has no place in you. It does not abide in you. And this is what we got to take away from this as well. Whenever you're sharing the word of God with an unbeliever, know this, be ready for it. It may find no place with them, and they may get aggravated at you. But be ready to take it, just like Jesus took it. But stand firm in the Word of God. So it leads us to one closing question. And the question is this. Why was Jesus so confrontational in his leadership? Everyone seems to, a lot of people seem to think that Jesus was this cream puff, you know, they always show pictures of him. He's like, you know, ah, you know floating around and everything. No, Jesus was a, was, a, was a strong leader. He was a leader that was, and I love that, 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 that saying, he had steel in his spine. Why? Because he would not bend to modernity. He would not compromise and bend to the world. He had steel in his spine. Why was Jesus so confrontational in his leadership? Well, the answer, because Jesus was on a mission to save souls. He knew that it would cost him his life. He understood how abrasive his message was to an evil world. Remember I spoke about that last week? He's telling his brother, he's saying, your world doesn't hate you. Man's world doesn't hate you, but man's world hates me. Why? Because I testify that its works are evil. Jesus had to confront the evil, and he did so in order to save souls. So I want to leave you with this. Jesus, I should say godly leaders, I should say always confront falsehood with truth, knowing that confrontation cost Jesus his life, but it saved ours confrontation caused Jesus his life, but it saved ours. And as he works in our hearts, he wants us to confront the unbelief within us as well in order that we may grow as godly leaders. What does the Bible say about God's end goal for us? Is that we, those who have come to faith in Christ, would be conformed more and more into his image. I say to you today, you want to grow as a godly leader? Be prepared to righteously confront yourself and others with the word of God. This is how we glorify God. This is how we glorify Christ. This is how we glorify the gospel that's been given to us by the Holy Spirit. May we be those godly leaders just as Christ was. Amen? I have three points for you. I have three key takeaways. And the first is this. Confront your unbelief with the truth of God's word. And the second, it is the word of God that influences and strengthens our leadership. Yeah, that's how we get stronger, beloved. That's how we get stronger, by allowing the word of God to influence and strengthen us. And finally, glorifying God in our leadership is priceless, but will come with confrontation, just as it did for our Savior and Lord. Let us be as brave. Amen? Amen? Now let us pray. Our Father and our God, we come before you this morning, and we praise you, Father, for your love. We praise you for your saving grace. We praise you, Lord God, for your word and how your word confronts us each and every time we read it. 
And so, Father, we pray that you would do your work through your word, that you will lead us to a transformed life, that in that, O oh God, we would truly glorify the one who dealt with the heartache, dealt with the confrontation, even to the point of death, the Lord Jesus Christ. For it is in his name that we pray. Amen.